the results of Olympia are very exciting. They're impactful. Uh, what they indicate is that for patients who have an inherited BRCA mutation and have developed breast cancer, those with a high risk of recurrence, uh, in addition to uh, standard uh, intensive chemotherapy, when the PARP inhibitor olaparib is added, there's a significant improvement and decrease in recurrences um, and mostly driven by a decrease in distant recurrences. So that's extremely exciting and impactful. I think one of the big obstacles is really identifying BRCA mutation carriers. Uh, I think it's very important that patients now in the early breast cancer setting are identified if they have an inherited BRCA mutation. There are studies showing that there's underutilization of germline genetic testing and that some studies showing less than half of patients who have a BRCA mutation or who meet criteria for testing are being offered testing. And I think it really begs the question now whether uh, all uh, patients with breast cancer early stage should be offered germline genetic testing. You know, we've done this genetic testing in the past to really inform us about a patient's risk of developing a future breast cancer, a second breast cancer, ovarian cancer, so that preventative surgery or intensive surveillance could be utilized. But now it really affects treatment and a very impactful practice changing treatment that will decrease recurrence and I think likely in time survival. So it's really important uh, that we identify BRCA carriers uh, at their diagnosis. So whether this means universal testing or uh, you know, really identifying the breast cancer patients who don't need genetic testing, rather than complicated criteria of who does need testing, it might be simpler to indicate who doesn't. Perhaps just older patients with ER positive disease, with large families and no family history. I mean, I don't know, but I think that the major barrier in my mind is identifying the mutation carriers. So I think there are a number of questions that Olympia raises. You know, one question that comes up a lot is what about all the patients that, who weren't eligible for the study? So the bar for eligibility was set very high for those patients who had ER positive HER2 negative disease. They needed to have, uh, if they went to surgery first, they needed to have four involved axillary lymph nodes. And if they had uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy first, they needed to have residual disease, but a larger amount of residual disease than those for triple negative disease. So, you know, one could ask the question, well, what about the BRCA carrier who has a T2 lesion and three positive lymph nodes? Wouldn't uh, a laparid benefit that patient? And we, you know, we just don't have the data. Biologically, one would have a hard time figuring out why a laparid might benefit the woman with four positive nodes, but not three positive nodes. But we just don't, we don't have that data at this time. So I'd say question number one, what about those patients who have breast cancer but didn't meet uh, the criteria for the study. I think the second question that's being asked is what about the duration of a laparid? Is this the right duration, one year? Um, in ovarian cancer, uh, certainly longer a laparid uh, is used, uh, PARP inhibitors, but those patients have a higher risk of recurrence and I worry that longer use of the PARP inhibitor could lead to more MDS or AML. So far in Olympia, uh, it's very reassuring that there has been no increased signal for leukemia or MDS. But the question could be asked, what about a shorter duration of a laparid? Uh, in Olympia, the curves separate early. They stay separated. One might ask, do we really need a, a full year of a laparid? Could a shorter duration uh, be effective? Um, and particularly that question for patients perhaps with lower risk breast cancer, the bracket carriers with lower risk, that would be a question. I think another question and the next frontier sort of uh, would be, what about the lower, lower risk breast cancer patients with a germline bracket mutation? Could this study, Olympia, was looking at bracket carriers with high-risk breast cancer. 95% of the patients in the study received intensive chemotherapy, anthracycline-based, taxane-based chemo. A quarter of them also received platinum. And the elaborate was added to that and decreases recurrences. Uh, 
But what about lower risk breast cancer? Could the PARP inhibitor, which generally is well tolerated and appears to be safe, could that um, spare the bracket carrier with lower risk breast cancer some chemotherapy? If the PARP inhibitor is used in the neoadjuvant setting and the patient has a complete response to the PARP inhibitor, might they be spared chemotherapy or at least be able to get less intensive chemotherapy if they have a great response to the PARP inhibitor? So I think those are all questions that arise from the great success and it's really a remarkable uh, results from the Olympia study.